I'm Michael Patel, president and founder of the Fatty Liver Alliance. We raise awareness about the risk, causes, and complications of fatty liver disease and help those already diagnosed with muscle dimash by advocating for access to approved treatments and care. Today, as my special guest, we have Dr. Jason Fung. Dr. Fung is a New York Times bestselling author of many books, including The Obesity Code and The Diabetes Code. He completed medical school at the University of Toronto and a fellowship in nephrology at UCLA. He's the co-founder of The Fasting Method, a program to help people lose weight and reverse type 2 diabetes naturally with intermittent fasting. He lives in the same city as I do, Toronto, Canada. He's also the scientific editor of the Journal of Insulin Resistance and the managing director of the nonprofit organization Public Health Collaboration in Canada, an international group dedicated to promoting sound in nutritional information. Dr. Fung, you are immersed in an incredibly relevant field to liver disease, especially muscle and mash. Obesity and the desire to reduce weight is a very hot topic now. GLP ones are in high demand. Green Mediterranean diet is in. What can you tell us about the work you've done in intermittent fasting, and what recommendations can you share? Yeah, so um, one of the things that's very interesting is that fatty liver was basically unheard of in 1980, and it goes from that to almost the most most important liver disease today because a lot of the hepatitis B, hepatitis C is getting under control. Of course, alcoholism is still an important uh, disease, but isn't increasing in prevalence, whereas uh, fatty liver disease and uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis are becoming basically more and more important. So from sort of virtual unknown to the most important liver disease today is quite the uh, stunning rise in prevalence. And the thing about it is that it's quite easy to understand uh, fatty liver disease, right? So fat is not supposed to be in the liver. Fat is supposed to be in the fat cell. So the question is, why do you have all this fat in the liver where it's not supposed to be? And the answer is, you know, in a very short uh, form is excessive uh, either sugar or carbohydrates. Because what happens when you eat excessive carbohydrates is that the liver turns those carbohydrates into fat in a process called de novo lipogenesis. So it takes the glucose and turns it into fat. So now you have too much fat in the liver. The fat does, the, the liver does try to export that fat out, uh, which leads to abdominal obesity and then the rest of the metabolic syndrome. So fatty liver disease goes very much hand in hand with type 2 diabetes and so on. So then if you say, well, the problem is excessive carbohydrate intake, well, there's several solutions. Um, you know, the, if, if the problem is too much uh, carbs, then a low carbohydrate diet is very uh, good. So a, a green Mediterranean or, you know, whole food plant-based or uh, low carb or ketogenic diet has shown quite, uh, you know, significant benefits in fatty liver disease. And ultimately, the other way to do it is through something which has been used for thousands of years, which is intermittent fasting. And again, not too difficult to understand. Not only are you not putting in glucose to the system, right? If, if you're putting in less glucose, the liver is not going to be able to turn that glucose into fat. But actually, when you fast, you actually do the opposite. You're going to start burning some of that fat because, well, obviously, you're not eating. So your body's going to need a source of energy. And it's going to pull it directly from the liver and deplete those fat stores. So you're basically allowing the body time to burn off all that excess fat. And so when we were doing our clinics, we would often measure uh, liver function tests. And very often with type 2 diabetes, we saw a lot of patients with fatty liver disease and uh, elevations in their liver enzymes, which indicated a small amount of damage. And almost inevitably, those, those um, reversed. That, that was like the most reliable way to reverse them. You know, you just started them fasting and, um, you know, it, it went away. So it's really, uh, you know, a very simple intervention. It's free. It's available to anybody. Anybody can do it. You don't need special permission. And basically, you're letting your body use that fat, right? Fat is a store of calories. It's there for you when you can't eat, when you don't eat or can't eat. So use it for what it was meant for. You're just using the fat for exactly the purpose your body stores fat, right? So just use it. Let your body use it up. Uh, you know, the whole idea is that, you know, everybody's so focused on giving drugs, creating drugs. It's like, well, you have a dietary disease, so fix the diet. 
don't fix, you know, create new drugs that have potential side effects or whatever. Ozempic, of course, is, is a drug that does help you with um, eating less and, you know, that sort of thing. So it can be of help for sure. But on the other hand, for people who want to do it by themselves, it's it's easily accessible. You just have to learn how to do it and how to do it successfully. It sounds like um, if you think about how society has changed since you go back to the caveman when you had to hunt for food and you didn't always have food readily available, I guess that's how we're programmed, right? In the long term, we probably haven't changed that much. So now when we have food available and we can eat anytime we want not even including that the fact that they're high in, in fructose and and sugars and and carbs and all that stuff but just just the fact that we're eating almost continually is probably not not the best thing health wise right yeah so for um thousands of years people acknowledge that you should really have a period of the day where you eat right that's your feeding period and during that time you're going to take in calories you're going to store calories because you're eating you should also have part of the day where you're not eating and that's the fasting period. So during that time, you're going to burn the energy, which is calories, that you took in. And you need to keep those in balance. However, in the last sort of few decades, there's been this inexplicable move towards let's eat all the time. You know, you hear this all the time, a healthy snack. You should snack. You should take a bedtime snack. You should never skip meals. You should never skip breakfast. So eat, 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 eat to lose weight. And I'm like, how do you expect that to actually work? You cannot lose weight when you're eating. The only way you can actually burn calories is to not eat. There's actually no other possible way. It's impossible. You eat constantly. You're never allowing your body a time to use it, right? You know, um, Stephen Harrison, who passed away recently, um, said at one of the lectures that I went to that you you can't out exercise your fork. <laughs> so I basically yeah. think that's exactly what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. And people people uh, essentially make this distinction because a lot of uh, food companies have put a lot of marketing dollars into promoting this idea that you can simply um, exercise your way out, right? And you can't really, because the amount of energy that you spend exercising is relatively small compared to what you eat. For so, sure. yeah, you know, yeah, if you exercise 10 hours a day, sure, you can, you can certainly do that. But if you're trying to exercise half an hour a day, like, you know, if you've ever gone on a treadmill, and uh, done a run at a reasonable pace. Like I'm not talking about, you know, 15 year old Olympic hopeful, right? I'm talking about a 60 year old, maybe with some bad knees, maybe with some Achilles tendonitis, right? They're not gonna do like 10 hours a day. So you're talking about half an hour, you go on the treadmill. If you've ever watched that calorie counter after half an hour, it's like a hundred calories, 100 right? calories maybe. which is like, you know, two cookies sort of thing. Right. So this idea, or, you know, a little bit of Gatorade or whatever. So this idea that you can just exercise your way out is really just this huge sort of um, myth promulgated by the food companies. Uh, on the one hand, theoretically, yes, you could, if you were Michael Phelps and swimming eight hours a day, sure. You could eat 10,000 calories because you yeah. are going to burn that. The rest of us, that's just not realistic. So, you know, the, the focus should be on the diet uh, because that's what's changed since 1980 is that people didn't eat all the time in the 1980s. They had this proper fasting period. Okay, so um, before we go, I want to ask you if you can give simple advice how somebody could start this. Should they read about it first? Should they, like, what is, you know, and I know that there's, you can eat on different days or eat on different times and it's eight hours eating, 16 hours not. And I don't know, you know, if there's one that, that you've, with your expertise, has found to be more effective or easier for people to maintain, which is probably the most important thing. Uh, you know, where should people start? Yeah, and for sure, you should start with uh, sort of getting more information. It's very easy these days. You could read one of my books, The Obesity Code, or The Complete Guide to Fasting. You can also go on YouTube where everything is free and just look under my name. There's tons of videos there about fasting, myths of fasting, fasting regimens, you know, all kinds of things, fasting myths, tips for fasting, everything you can think of 
But basically, all you want to do is you, you want to start with having a period of the day that you don't eat, eat. So after dinner to breakfast, and that should be about 12 to 14 hours. Then if you want, you can you, you should also cut out snacks. You can also then extend it if you feel like to sort of 16 hours or even longer, 20 hours if you want. You can drop meals. Again, when you drop that one meal, you don't want to eat more the next meal because Right. You know, taking the equivalent of sort of breakfast and lunch all in one sitting is not the point. The point is to drop one of them. So say you drop breakfast. The point is not to eat a huge lunch. If you drop breakfast, you want your body to take the energy of breakfast, say 500 calories, to pull that out of your body fat, the liver fat, if you will, right? You want your body to eat that liver fat. So if you double up at lunchtime, you're not going to do yourself any good because you're just going to store it back, right? So you want to just drop it and not, not add it on. So essentially what you're doing is um, trying to get your body used to this new regimen. And the good news is that once you get used to it, the, the, you get a, you know you, you start not to even miss it because it just becomes a habit. So cutting out the snacks, cutting out uh, you know either breakfast or dinner uh, you know a couple of times a week, then you decide for yourself. Do you, you can extend it on certain days? If you're very sick and very uh, motivated, you could go longer. You could go 24 hours. You could you can go multiple days if you want. But you always want to be safe. Always talk to your doctor. Get yourself some information before you start. I wonder if one of the challenges is the social aspects of it, because you're, you know, you, especially on weekends, you want to go out with friends or family. And so that's a tough time to just skip, right? Especially at dinner. I think that would be harder even. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And social, the social implications are actually the most difficult of them. That's why you want to sort of uh, fit it in where you can, you know, cutting out snacks is a great way to start. Because remember, even in the 70s, people ate breakfast, lunch and dinner, they didn't necessarily uh, fast for extended periods. But every single day, they would eat dinner at say, six or seven, wouldn't eat again until seven or eight, you're talking 12, 13 hours every single day without even thinking about it. They didn't consider it fasting. That was just normal. If you wanted a, a bedtime snack, your mom would say, no, you should eat more at dinner. Like too bad, go to bed, right? And that was it, right? And there was no two ways about it. There, weren't, there, there wasn't this idea, oh, my poor baby, go get yourself a couple of cookies. It's like, well, that, what's that going to do? It's going to make you fat. That's basically what it's going to do. Everybody knows that. So why did you need those cookies? The answer is you didn't. It was just another huge myth sort of promoted by food companies who you know, convinced the doctors and the dietitians to give us this advice that, hey, you should snack all the time. You should graze, constantly graze throughout the day. And it's like, if you constantly graze throughout the day, like, like the, only, the only things that should be doing that are like cows, right? And other ruminants not humans. We should be leaving a period of the day. That's why we have this word breakfast, the meal that breaks your fast. You have to fast to break your fast. It means that fasting is a part of every day. That, that's It's been excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Fung. And, uh, I know that uh, a lot of people are really interested in this too. And uh, just start, I guess, is the idea. Even if you do it one day a week, right? Just get started and try it and, and build up. Just from get that. started, build up and see how you feel. Go from there. And then, you know, if you, if you, um, you know, if you want to learn more, just go to, to, you know, my YouTube channel and you can watch basically anything you want for free. Excellent. Good plan. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. We'll talk again. Okay, I'm no sure. Problem. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.